Okay, welcome, friends. Thank you for coming by and checking out what my friend Willow Green and I are going to chat about for a while now. <laughs> <laughs> what I'm getting at is like most of these podcasts, all you're doing is eavesdropping on two friends talking. Okay. We get a little bit of a framework, but I assure you it's going to probably cover just about the first five minutes. And then we're just going to let where spirit guides us. This is going to be a lot of fun, but I guess it does kind of make it helpful to, to let you know what led to this conversation. So Willow was introduced to me by a mutual friend. Joey Costa, I don't know, about a week or so ago, no more than two weeks ago. And Willow and I, for whatever reason, felt led to, hey, let's get to know each other. Let's let's get on the phone and talk. And in the course of that conversation, we hit it off so well, we were just like, you know, we should probably like just record this and stuff. Um, let other people in on these things, because just like one topic led to another and it just started building to a crescendo again that we got that epiphany the shared insight that this is a friendship that's building um that is probably bigger than the two of us <laughs> so um so you, again you I guess you're gonna see live without a net two people get to know each other a little bit better um and again it probably helps if you again you might know a little bit about me you know what but this is really more about showcasing willow and her work at least for me i am just wanting to know so much more about this amazing woman so to let you to be a good host i will let you know that willow green she's an author she has written a couple books that the topics are quite fascinating to me they may be for you as well she's also a death doula which I don't know about you, but until I met a couple of women before her, up until maybe about two years ago, a death doula, it, it's two words I've never heard put together before. Well, actually, I never heard of a doula before. <laughs> 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 um, it, it is something that I'm intrigued with. I find it is one of the most beautiful things a human can do for another human. Um but, but really, truly, my understanding is so incomplete that I, I really hope that Willow will fill in the blanks inside my head and let you know about this amazing thing she does. And then we'll kind of go from there. <laughs> Let's have some Thank fun. you so much, Randy. And hello to everyone who's watching. Thank you for um, choosing to show up and witness us and learn from us today. We really appreciate you. Yeah. So let's let's begin with that. For those that is, are not familiar with what a death doula does, um, how do you serve humans? How do I serve humans as a death doula? Death, first and foremost, I'm going to share that I am an advocate for death. As a death doula, we really have to decide, are we an advocate for death? Are we an advocate for humans? What are we actually advocating for? And my personal desire is to advocate for death. And it doesn't always re, uh, mean death of a body. It can be death of an idea, death of a belief system. And with every death, whether it's the actual body or just the energy or an idea or a label, there's a rebirth. And so for me, it's it's not focusing on the death as much as it's focusing on the entire experience and letting go of one aspect of reality and embracing another. Yeah. Um, and I'll stop there and see how that lands. Well, Again, why I think again, it is such a beautiful service to another human being, you touched on and stuff. And one of the commonalities we share is transitioning from a lifestyle that you know, worked for a little while and then it didn't. <laughs> Trans basically, both Will and I are, are different than we were for most of our lives. We've We've been transformed with this thing called sobriety. And uh, it is, if anybody uh, has ever gone through this uh, metamorphosis, um, you know, nothing changes outside of us, but inside of us, it's a whole new world. Um, so in regards to what you're speaking of, again, being an advocate of death, yes, the old must fall away for the new to be birthed, okay? And it's really, really difficult. Well, I'll speak for myself. Yeah, but I've worked with other people 
<laughs> as well too. We know what we know. And even if it is dysfunctional and it is extremely emotionally painful, sometimes physically painful too, um, we continue on with it because at least we are familiar with it. It seems insane. And I believe many people, when they speak of the insanity of addiction and stuff, that's what they're referring to. Um, but if we're, it's not just limited to, to substance abuse. There's people, um, say, relationally. Okay, You have a relationship maybe with a parent, with a peer, um, a sibling, and, and such. And, and that relationship comes to a point where you're just like, no, this is a difficult relationship. And you make a, a dramatic change in how that dynamic is working. That's hard. It, again, would you say that's, I'm interpreting what you do in that way as well? When you say change to what's not working in the relationships, absolutely. We have roles in a relationship and we have personas that we embody and take on. And so a lot of times I hear death of the ego and I don't like that concept because death of the ego is death of us and the ego, our egos are here right now. And so if we give death to our egos, we no longer exist. And so it's really about embracing our ego and the best of our ego and bringing forward that which we choose and wish to be. And then accepting that, embracing that, working to that. It's death of that role, death of that identity, death of that behavior pattern. And with that death comes an opportunity for this regrowth, for this rebirthing, for this new way of being, new way of behaving, new way of communicating, new way of everything. And so, yeah, and, and it's and it's understanding the roles that we once took on, say the addict, which is what we're talking about. You and I both embraced being the addict at one point, but when we chose saying this is no longer working for us, we had to change our behavior patterns. We had to change our thinking patterns. We had to change everything about how we did things, how we interacted, how we engaged. Um, a lot of that is learning that our connections and our bonds might have been trauma bonds or trauma connections and, and giving death to those. And that's what I'm hearing you saying about the relationships. So sometimes the relationships that were healthy or that we uh, engaged in and embraced no longer serve us and they bring out the best in us. And so it's when we're giving death to that part of ourselves, if the other person that is engaging in the role and that is keeping this relationship alive is not willing to change with us or has no interest in giving death to that and embracing and rebirthing a brand new relationship and a new way of communicating and a new way of connecting, then sometimes, unfortunately, we have to let that relationship go and make space for new ones that... Um, support our health, support our new way of being, support our choices. Once we realize that we actually have choices and then we find the strength and the courage and the vulner vulnerability to make those choices and make those changes. Oh yeah, yeah. So what I heard you use repeatedly is a state of being. Mm -hmm. um, and, but we only talked a little bit about ego and I could share my definition of ego, but I'd really like to hear yours. So when you talk about, again, it's it's not the death of the ego, because yes, again, egoic thinking is the whole, I think, therefore I am. <laughs> You're not in your head and stuff. So again, I'd like for you to elaborate for, for my benefit and then any listener's benefit, what, what you're referring to as the ego. You and I right now, this is our egos communicating with each other. We are our ego, however we choose to express that. Because when our ego dies, we die. Like, we can't be without having some sort of an ego. My ego can be uh, cheerful, it can be loving, it can be aggressive, but it's all me. And so it's really an understanding that it's a way of being and not poo-pooing the ego but in saying how do I want my ego to show up how do I want to express myself what ways of being do I want to embody and um how do I want them to come through me okay okay 
So, yeah, that, again, that's that's really helpful for myself because I, my definition of ego was very much about uh, a persona. OK, and, and a lot of that has to do with, I don't know, accomplishments, you know, a lot of times you know, it's not always grandiosity. So for myself, up until I really got in, into working on my inner self, I just kind of figured, yeah, when you're being egotist, egotistic, you know, again, the ego was inflamed and such. It typically meant that I was taking a position that I was special and better than other people. But again, ego is very much self-concept uh, as well as worldview. Is that what you're thinking? Um, I'm not sure how to answer that. What I'm hearing you saying and what I'm thinking or what's coming through me when you say that, because you thought when, when you think of it, you thought of egotistical, you thought of grandiose or one way of being. However, right now our egos are present and our egos are totally engaged in each other. They're totally present with each other. And so if we give death to the ego, we're giving death to the experience we're having right now. It's not about like those were attachments to belief systems is what I'm understanding, what, what your thought process was on the ego. Whereas uh, this is our egos interacting right now. And so it's the ego interacting in a very different way. And so if we give depth to the ego as a whole, we're giving depth to this opportunity that we're sharing right now and that we're co-creating. And so it's about seeing the ego as whoever we choose to be in that moment, which is the beauty of it is we can give depth to that personality that we embody. We can give yes. depth to the idea and the behavior patterns that we had as addicts, but it, those were patterns. We are not our we are not our behaviors. We are us. And yes. so the ego from a lot of understandings is the how we express ourselves. And so it's giving depth to that old way of expressing ourselves or coping or um, alienating or getting using the or using and choosing to embrace an entirely new ego or identity or personality, which is what we're doing right now, which is one of vulnerability, one of acceptance, one of openness, one of um, heart centered and willingness to communicate, connect and be uncomfortable. But that's still our ego um, learning to be learning a new role. Mm -hmm. But we're, we're not our role. We're not our ego. We're not our identity. We are we are this and it's how we choose to express it. It's how we choose to use our words. It's how we choose to connect and engage. Yeah. Yeah. No, you say it so much better. I was ready to just kind of say, well, again, on the theme of grandiosity, death of the ego is thinking that I am superior or less than others. So then that's not death of the ego. That's death of that thought process. That's death right. of the that's why you say and embracing the unity. Right. Which, again, is, when I heard you speak of, of a state of being, is we are being in a, again, this vulnerable state that allows, instead of a competition, a collaboration. And, and yes. we're meeting together at a point, again, where... I'll, I'll just kind of say equals, but I don't think that word's sufficient enough here we are again we're just being ourselves without fear of judgment of, of one friend said, talks about without fear of punishment you know um i very much changed my behavior and thought patterns to meet the satisfaction of my parents and my peers to fit in um and again that's what i'm referring to is the, the self self-concept of this and again of moments of that i'm either better than you or i'm less than you type of type of stuff but yeah my thought patterns are following a, a paradigm of that is much more unity who we are underneath all those thoughts is really beyond thought comments well, and what you were just saying was the options that you understood 
were competing, comparing better than, worse than, but there was, or equals. What if we're just witnessing each other and totally embracing each other's uniqueness without judgment, without attachment and just allowing? Therefore, there's um, just this openness and willingness to learn or see different perspectives in a very non-threatening way. Since there is no comparison, there is no competition. It's just like, wow, you and I are different. You're male, I'm female. Um, you're in California, I'm in Michigan. We have two totally different experiences, two totally different backgrounds, two totally different um, histories of how we were programmed and then how we received and then how we interpret what we receive and then express that or reiterate it. And so what I'm what I'm hearing and what I'm learning is that it doesn't have to be any of that other than we're just receivers that are saying, okay, this is what I'm hearing and understanding, which is the communication that we're saying, and then clarifying that we um, understand each other correctly and that we are receiving, interpreting, and co-creating in a way that feels good to both of us and that makes sense to our minds without any judgment, without any competition, without any distractions or attachments, but just, okay, this is two egos or humans choosing to share space with each other and mutually understand each other, mutually understand each other's perspectives, mutually understand each other's views and see how we can use our words since that's how we were taught to communicate to really open up our minds and free us of these traps that are we get stuck in. And the traps are not lack of love or lack of desire a lot of times, it's lack of communication or lack of ways to express ourselves to um, create that connection. Most fights or disconnection is not lack of trying, otherwise the opposing forces wouldn't keep coming together. Clearly there's both care, both love, there's a desperation and a desire to connect. And it's usually the words, the behavior patterns or the expressions that create the conflict just in its lack of training, it's lack of understanding, it's lack of having the appropriate um, words. Yes. Well, for myself, it was a, a level of comprehension. Um, my ability per, to perceive without all the filters, the, the programming and, and such. So, um, yeah, I mean, it, it doesn't really need much elaboration, but communication is at least 50% listening. I'd argue that it might even be a higher percentage. If I can't receive you if i can't see you it's impossible for me to to even understand you a little bit so again my what i'm receiving and and returning is going to likely be at best incomplete you know but typically more often it's incorrect and of course how is anything going to how is there going to be any collaboration when when that's going on so again, for the death of that to happen begins very much like with the recovery process. When you have to admit there's that problem. Oh my God, you just said that? Why didn't you tell me sooner? I've been telling you that. <laughs> oh my yeah. God. Again, to be, so to be in a moment where there's enough honesty and a humility to actually have that moment of clarity, um, is a beautiful thing, but also sometimes, again, speaking for myself, a very uncomfortable and painful moment. Because again, I have this self-concept. What do you mean? I, <laughs> I hear you loud and clear. I know very well what you're saying to me. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and stuff. Yeah. So again, it has to, to, to again, to the similarities of this death of the ego again that's not necessarily again our identities fallen it's just we've got we're going through like a a metamorphosis or uh again the the butterfly the the caterpillar turning into the butterfly it's the next version of ourselves it just happened and there was many many different phases of that that lead to the hinge point how to say which again kind of the thing is we're talking about much more of about a uh a mental uh an intellectual 
uh, a mindful. It's a mental construct. Know, surrendering that we were trained. Yeah. yeah, I'm sorry. A mental construct. Yes. Yeah. So that's what, again, but so that's again, just to get people clear on what, what we were talking about there. Probably went a little bit more. <laughs> again, we're just having some fun here. I, I wanted to get to know her perspectives because I learned so much from her. Um, so Willow, then though, typically when somebody is going to hire you in this role of a, a death doula, though, it's the physical transition. Is that correct? That's where I'm at now, but that's not where I started. I started with psychopomp and I've done a lot of death and rebirth. And even if it is the physical transi transition, it's still a death and a rebirth. There's still a grieving period and there's the death of one physical body, but there's all this grief, there's all this energy, there's all this focus that's going into that and all this love that then has to be rebirthed by all the survivors, all of the people who have focused all of this energy around the death. And so either way, what, and that's why I say I'm an advocate for death, because whether it's the death of a body or the death and rebirth of an experience, a lot of it is the same. It all, it all um, requires a lot of grieving, a lot of vulnerability. Um, a lot of communication, a lot of honesty a lot of feeling uh, and feeling is the main thing feeling communication understanding there's there's layers that we have to go through um layers of understanding i'll leave it at that for now there and layers of programming um yeah i'm not sure how to keep going with this one but I think that I answered your question in that moment. You, There's yes, a couple of things yes. that I that you've sparked, and I uh, I'm not sure how to talk about them in this moment. Well, would, I, would you like to explore it a little bit? Sure. So what I'm comparing this to is uh, Dr. David Hawking's. Um, I got exposed to this in, in Power versus Force, but it's it's the basically he's he's has a test this is scientific it's been repeatable but as our conscious levels ascend there are typical behavior patterns and emotions you're not in your head so you're familiar with this but maybe the listener isn't but again these layers at the base level it, 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 you know for very simplistic way of describing it it's very fearful okay and again when i was referring to self-concept of being less than others okay i cannot meet my expectations. I cannot meet your expectations. I The greatest fear for myself, and I've had this, a few people confide into me, this as well, that I'm not worthy of being loved. That fear, I mean, maybe the greatest of all existential concerns. Yeah. If I am this authentic being, Without my persona that I've adjusted, the chameleon to fit in and get you to like me and to love me. If I'm not going to be the person that I've concluded you need me to be to be lovable, then yeah, then I am I'm going to basically be damned to hell on earth. No one wants me. I am unacceptable as myself. So that like is low level fear. Okay. And if the listeners kind of go on that seems a little harsh and a little extreme let me reassure you uh, again few people not just randy have confided in me i have a hypothesis there's plenty of people because again this is this is another way of saying shame you know people do not talk about shame that's just kind of the the status quo because again we're shamed <laughs> it's easy enough to laugh i'm sorry if it if that touches a nerve so again, this is lower level stuff. And, but when we do get honest and open and vulnerable and start sharing and somebody goes, yeah, me too. I'm not the only one who thinks and feels this way. No, you're not. Then all of a sudden you start ascending up this scale, but you can get to a level that, um, according to Hawkins, you know, on a scale of zero to a thousand, this level of en enlightenment is like Christ or the Buddha and such. And, 
And this is obviously something that's not obtained by most people in, in a lifetime or 10 or 20 or 100. But, <laughs> um, but we can get somewhat closer. In the, and for a more practical way of speaking of this is getting to the point of, of having peace within us and an equanimity where we can be calm and cool. And those things that used to trigger a response, um, we can be neutral view the world okay so um what are, what are your thoughts on this willow that was a huge range um so i'm gonna go back to where you started shame and a lot of the things that people don't talk about yes this path started with me because i tried to commit suicide i felt that shame in ways that um I didn't want to live anymore. I was bulimic. I was anorexic. I hated myself. Like I actually just did a talk with my doula groups about coming back from self-hatred. I uh, was originally suicidal at 15, put on pharmaceuticals. I was Baker acted at 20 or 21 and put in a psych ward. And at 30, I actually tried to commit suicide and was in rehab. And so I embodied all of this and going back to Dr. Hawkins and the levels of consciousness, like that's one of my favorite books of his is understanding the levels of consciousness and moving through what you were talking about, but it's understanding and having, being able to witness my own fear, witness my own shame and own it because until we're willing to own it, we can't change it. And so it's really about acknowledging our victim mentality, our victim behavior, and being willing to own it and shift it. And that was really hard for me. It was hard for me to acknowledge, yeah, I'm a gaslighter and manipulative as fuck, because that is how I had to survive. That um, a lot of my relationships were transactional because that was what I understood to be connection and love. And so for me, I had to give death to all of that and be willing to acknowledge that my understanding of love, it doesn't feel good to me and it doesn't resonate with my inner child, my authentic self and who I'm choosing to become. And I had to acknowledge that the behavior patterns that I, uh, were do the behavior patterns that I was, living with were not ones that served me that a lot of the patterns uh, were things that protected me as a child or were things that I did to cope when I didn't have the wisdom, the help, the uh, words to process. And those patterns became self-sabotaging and toxic. And I had to see that and be willing to acknowledge that and then be able to change them and changing them is the hardest part because it wasn't just about changing my thought process and my behaviors in my mind. I consciously changed it, but my physiology was still stuck. It's stuck in the cellular memory, my behavior patterns, um, the bulimia. I would stuff my emotions. I would eat my emotions and then I would vomit them because I had no idea how to process them. And so I had to learn new skills. What do I do with this energy? What do I do with this emotion? How do I process it? How do I express it in a way that's healthy? And it took me a while that even though I consciously made that decision, it took time to implement the new physical pattern in my physiology. And I would go through times where I would be stuck in this rage or this emotion and I would be acting and done with something before I even realized or had a consciousness of what my actions were. And so it really took a lot of time to understand that I needed to slow down and breathe first and become aware of what these behaviors were and what these coping mechanisms were. And that's the, that was a lot of the hardest part for me because we don't want to admit that we're stuck in shame. And a lot of these patterns, if we never get outside of our comfort zone, outside of the environment in which we were raised, we can't even see them because we understand that's the way that life is. It's the way our society is, but it's not the way society is and life is. It's the way our tiny little uh, ecosystem is, which is what we have. Um, this didn't make sense to me until I entered. I've lived in over 150 homes and traveled around the world, exploring and studying different cultures, different ecosystems, different families, different ways that of communicating, different behavior patterns. 
And what I've noticed is that nothing is as hereditary as um, the story. And once we accept the story, the physiology and everything else supports the story. Once we change our story and change our belief system, then we're able to shift our behavior patterns and shift everything else and create a new pattern. But if we don't do that consciously, intentionally, and with the appropriate support, we could be creating even worse uh, behavior patterns and, and incorporating behaviors that are equally unbecoming or unsupportive. And so it's really about getting clear on what we're doing, what we want, and how we want to express it. And then looking at it from this state of neutrality, it's not good or bad, it's just, okay, got almost like data. I remember my sponsor in AA was, was saying, it's like, you're just a detective. You're <laughs> just getting the facts. You're getting the clues here, Randy, and, and stuff. This may be beneficial in solving the crime, <laughs> or it may not, you know? And, and, and sometimes, like the detectives, okay, you follow some false leads, you know, <laughs> kind of stuff. But as you said, owning it, no one else is responsible for the quality of my life but Randy. Okay? Mm -hmm. And that was huge for me to shake the victim mode. About three years when I did my personal inventory, as I went through all my resentments and my parts in them and stuff, the, the, the big takeaway was that I was addicted to blaming people, places. And it's another form of rationalization and justification. You know, I did this because of you, because Willow did this. I had to do this kind of stuff. It's not my fault. And when I realized that, you no, know, I made a choice, even though it was probably driven by unconscious paradigms, the, the narratives, the stories and, and such, nonetheless, I took responsible for that choice in my actions and, and such. Um, that made it then a very natural thing to go, well, if then if this is your bed and this it's you, you've got to lie in it, or you can just get out of bed and make your bed and carry on and do better next next time. And then again, there was um, a non-dualistic approach of here of accepting full responsibility, but also full forgiveness as well too, because I did the best I could at this point in time. And now because I know better, there's no reason for me to return back there unless I consciously choose it. So again, if I am in a habitual pattern, it's okay, dude, then, you just got, for some reason, some stuff still underneath the current that is telling you that it's okay to do this. And eventually there will be enough pain where you say it's enough, but not a moment sooner than you can, that they will refer into the recovery to you concede to your innermost self till there's this um, thought before the thought. Again, I don't need to fully understand it. I just know I'm done. So if anybody's listening to this again, as I'm bringing up recovery and you do suffer from saying never again, and you're doing whatever you're doing to, to make sure that happens. And you find yourself back into that old behavior and, and you're not too happy about that. And you're not feeling too confident about who you are. Know that, that that's probably, I'm not a psychiatrist and I don't know you, so I'm not going to try to give you an absolute, but that's probably what's happening. And as Willow talked about, it's not easy to break that cycle, but it is possible. Is that right, Willow? Yeah. What I'm hearing you say right now is that you, once you understood you had a choice, you recognized your behavior pattern of reacting or laying in bed and chose to upgrade that to responding since you realize you do have a choice and now you're choosing to respond, which is what we do. The victim reacts and then we find out we have a choice and then we get to choose to respond. And you have done that and explained that masterfully with instead of laying in bed, pouting and crying, we get up and we make the bed and we go out and we do something to be productive and proactive. And so it's really about taking responsibility and choosing to respond and make uh, progressive choices. And again, in recovery, it's about progression, not perfection. And yeah, you explained that wonderfully. And I would totally agree with you. Okay, good. Now, um, again, and, and as you were uh, repeating back what I shared, the kindness, the self-compassion, the self-forgiveness for me was huge. 
one of the, again, one of the narratives that I carried with me was growing up in a household with, with a father that was uh, very harsh. And um, somewhere along the way, I, I kind of figured that was the means to self-correction was being very harsh upon myself. You know, I, I used an internal dialogue that I consider cruel. I would not speak to another human being the way I spoke to myself. So to, one, to be observant of it, and two, to realize I had a choice on it, and three, then to act upon it. And, and as you mentioned, the, the authentic self being the inner child, being the inner parent to the inner child, the, the executive center, the authority in my, my brain that can look at this from a position of wisdom. I'll use the word wisdom. And, and that's intelligence and, and, and uh, emotion under the heart. The head and the heart are coming together for wisdom. Um, that I can speak to myself the way that my, I wished that my father did. When an authority figure could say, it's like, look at you, you're you're trying really hard. And yeah, yeah, it's it's not working out so well as quick as you wanted. You know? But notice you haven't given up. You know, that type of language to myself as opposed to you're an idiot, you'll never be able to do this. So yeah. Um, Am I on course for your experiences or those that you've talked with, Willow? Well, I don't want to compare. I'm hearing you and I'm being very present with you. Um, I'm hearing how you shifted the voices in your head. And what I'm getting from this is that you had a programmed thought process. And that once you realized you could shift this thought process, you took your power back and instead of listening to your dad's voice, you chose to engage in your own voice and create uh, your own program that is now supportive of your new behavior and who you're choosing to be. Because as children, we don't have control over the patterns that are being uh, brought to us from the people who raised us, whether they're our biological parents, adopted parents, family members, community, whoever. We are a product of our environment. We are a product of our community. We are a product of the environment in which we're raised in. And some people have, and we all have different experiences in that based on where uh, our community or our the people responsible for us, what their experience was. And when I witness this in myself and in others, I look at that programming, I look at those behavioral patterns, I look at the communication patterns, and I say, it goes back to what we were talking about in the beginning, if there's still a dialogue and there's still a disconnect, but there is a desire to connect, then there's a desire to upgrade the communication system. And if our parents, our environment, or whoever say or do things that don't feel good to us, it's most likely that they're doing a better job for us than was done for them and that they're doing the best that they can with what they have. Because parents, I don't know any parent that keeps a child that has a desire to hurt or uh, do anything to their child other than bring out the best in them. And so a lot of it is just upgrading that. Our parents do better than, than what was done for them. So it makes me look and say, okay, if these were your dad's words and this was your programming, what did your dad go through? If he's trying to be a better version and a better guide for you, what was his experience and how can we have compassion for both that and for ourselves, knowing that he did the best that he did for us and then choosing to then upgrade that even more in a way that now serves us rather than, and I hear you saying, I'm choosing to no longer blame or shame myself or my father, but instead I'm saying, okay, it's a new day, it's a new uh, life, it's a new world, and my reality is what I choose it to be, it's what I create it to be, and it's the story that I that I talk about it. And so when we upgrade our self-talk, our entire world, reality, and physiology upgrade with it. In my experience. And yeah, you're absolutely right. My dad said several times, you're, you're lucky I, I, I'm not your grandfather and your grandfather would have beat the shit out of you right now kind of stuff. So my dad probably came up through, a, and I knowing the little bit I did to my grandfather, my grandfather was a very cruel, mean man. He used to take, take not just myself and my sister, but I guess it was all the kids. He'd take us when we'd hug grandpa, he'd have like a day old beard 
stubble kind of stuff and rub our face against it like a sandpaper. So then it and makes you wonder what his childhood was like because oh, yeah, this is yeah. how, again, it's and just, so yeah. what we're really addressing right now, because everything is in our physiology, it's stored in our cells. We were actually formed inside of our grandmothers. And so whatever our grandmother's experience was, is what is trapped in our DNA. Right. But you mentioned adoptive. I am uh, myself and my sister are adopted children. So it's, I, I, again, I've, I contemplated, you know, is it nature or is it nurture? And I think it's a combination. It's not an either or principle that whoever my birth mother is, my birth grandmother is, um, yeah, absolutely has affected me. It's my DNA straight and such, but the nurturing that I, I experienced shaped me is just as much as, as my DNA. And, um, yeah, it's, it's again. It's been very helpful having a non-dualistic, uh, again having a paradigm of of an either or instead of a both and a way of, of of self awareness as well as as I look out into the world. That is is you're pointing out so eloquently and such that yeah, the person who is, could be very cruel, very harsh to us. Um, yeah, let's not diminish the fact that, that what they're doing is what they're doing. But understanding that there is also, this is probably, in fact, no, not probably, it is the effect. There's a cause, unseen cause for this type of behavior. In fact, it's kind of funny, just yesterday I was talking about bullying. The ones that bullied myself, I have no idea who their bully was, whether it was an older sibling or some other kid on the schoolyard or a parent or whatever and stuff. But I feel confident enough to speak that it would, this level of certainty they're just passing on the energy. Yeah. As I did, as I did as well. Cause I yeah. that's a, a, a big part of this conclusion is because I bullied smaller kids than me, you know? So, because I couldn't stand up for myself to the, the one that was bigger and stronger than me, um, I could not defend myself. So that, frustration that energy was directed towards another individual it's a transference of powerlessness yeah. and at some point that's when we start uh, that's how addiction starts we feel so powerless we just say fuck it and we escape but yeah what you're describing the bully the bully it's definitely a transference of powerlessness and not being able to stand up to what we need to and so we take that and yeah do what's being done to us because we don't know what else to do with it and if that energy never gets um upgraded and we never have the tools to learn not to do that then that's what we embody as adults yeah yeah even though it may be a slight upgrade just because we don't want to transmit it again as you mentioned again parents doing the best they can for their kids and my dad's reference at least i'm not physically you know, doing things to correct your behavior, not beating the shit out of you like my dad did, kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, from part of it, again, in my process of understanding my relationship with my father and in and, and my attempt to make amends with him, I think he received it. I don't know. He was he still had very much a, a force field of of his emotions, but um came to the point to acknowledge the harm. And this was, again, for me, was really important to, that, yeah, I understand that you're passing on generational or, again, possibly, again, something that's happened to you in your life, lifetime towards me, dad, that you probably only want the best for me when you are doing this thing that's hurting me. But you did hurt me. And, again, that honesty, that humility and, and such, and then understanding that yeah there was a responsibility there was a part i did did certain actions that uh, again caused him to want to correct my behavior again it's not to get too complicated but the bottom line is what i'm getting at is i was not a victim i was a participant in all this this wounding here and if nothing else is if someone's kind of coming out but what when you were a child how were you really a participant with this because i had expectations that my dad should be a different dad. And that for me was the huge thing is these expectations, the shoulds. I should be different. 
You should be different. The world should be different. These are how these, again, me recognizing these narratives that I, we all carry, you know, um, but to keep it mm-hmm. so it's not assumptive, you know, and Randy's narratives and, and such, eventually it's like, yeah, the world does not work as you assume it should be. That you insist it to be many days, you know, and and if you're wondering how that kind of comes into normal conversation, it's when we have resentments and when we have regrets, <laughs> we have these unrealistic demands that the world meet, meets our expectations for us to be okay. And I was never okay. And when I realized that, again, I was using drugs and alcohol to, to get that okayness and that wasn't working and that was killing me and I choose to live, then I had to figure out an alternative. And fortunately people before me had come to that conclusion and that level of acceptance. And I believe what I'm trying to set up now, again, is that part of what you share with other people is helping people let go of the shoulds and the should nots, the expectations on on how they and the world should be? I meet people where they are and I let them decide what they want. And if that is what they would like to do, then yes, um, I help them reprogram. Basically, we hold everything at a cellular level. So imagine our body is like a computer. Remember back in the day when we used to defragment the computer? So that's what the energy work does to the body. It defragments the body. It unlocks all of that um, pain, trauma, memory from the cellular level. And then NLP helps upgrade the communication system. And so a lot of it is, yes, opening up and releasing all of that. And then choosing how do I want to be today? How do I want to be now? How do I want to be moving forward? And there's no judgment. There's no shame. There's no blame. It's feedback. It's clear words. It's clear communication. Yes, this was my understanding. And I'm choosing now to have a new understanding. I was trained that this is the story I put to that sensation. And now I get to choose to have a sensation without a story to move through it. In my experience, I find that the story actually keeps us stuck and um, putting, trying to use logic won't work. It actually makes it worse, allowing the energy, the expression to move through and then opening up the possibilities for choice and options and then supporting the new way of being and just moving forward from there. I don't necessarily believe in forgiveness anymore because if there's no blame and there's no shame, there's no need for forgiveness. And so if we can just bypass and stop blaming and stop shaming, we don't need to spend time on forgiving and we can actually take all that time and energy and focus it on who we choose to become and moving forward from today. I like that. I like that a lot. Makes perfect sense to me. So I think what we've done is now segued into something that you wanted to share with myself and those that are listening in that meditation. Yeah, let's do that. Let's do a meditation on letting go of blame, shame, forgiving, and all of the unnecessary stuff and uh, choose to just be. Would um, to, to, embody and embrace moving forward what would you like to have compassion yes what else clarity, um, clarity would be again i i think the two to go hand in glove um but again you mentioned when um there's no blame no shame again there's no judgment involved and there's no need for forgiveness and again that makes perfect sense why do why would I need to forgive if there's been no foul? <laughs> no harm harm done. Yeah, so, if somebody spills um, your coffee, then if you're not mad at them and you don't blame them, you don't have to forgive them. You just okay, shit happens. I spilled my fucking coffee. Right, right. So I I um I love how the universe works. Sorry, I've got a c I've got a sailor mouth. <laughs> no, 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 no. Again, it's just because it, it the the meeting I went to the AA meeting I went to this mor- morning and such the topic was getting into forgiveness of ourselves for being less than we thought we didn't want to be alcoholics we we 
insisted that we were not alcoholics, that that type of conversation and that resistance to that very obvious to everybody else in the world. <laughs> we are alcoholics. Um, yeah, that resistance, it, it, it postponed the inevitable. Again, obviously, I'm talking in a group of people that have chosen to, as well as myself, to to no longer be an alcoholic or again behave in a, in a way that is alcoholic um but yeah forgiveness was something we just talked about a few hours ago so i'd love to have you refragment okay my cool. narratives and my concepts about that let's start there then so then i'm going to invite you to go ahead and close your eyes and everyone who's watching i'm going to invite you to go ahead and close your eyes and take a deep breath in through the nose, holding at the top, and audibly let go. <sighs> and taking a deep breath in through the nose, breathing all the way down into the belly, feeling the belly expand and exhaling and just keep that rhythm going of breathing in through your nose deep into your belly long and slow allowing your breath to slow down allowing you to become present giving yourself permission to be fully present right now giving yourself permission to let the outside world go Trusting that if any thoughts come in, see them like clouds, allow them to just pass on through, witnessing them, acknowledging them, and giving yourself permission not to get stuck on them. Feeling your body supported, feeling your butt supported, feeling your back supported. Taking another deep breath in and with each breath, allowing something else to go, scanning your body, allowing your shoulders to relax, allowing your jaw to relax, allowing your eyes to relax, letting your ears relax, feeling your forehead and your whole head just release Relax and let go, sinking down deeper, feeling it all supported by your body. Giving yourself permission to just be here now, listening to my voice. And knowing that everything that comes out of my mouth and that you hear is an invitation only. These are invitations, however, you have a choice. You always have a choice. So you are invited right now to focus on my voice, to hear it as a loving guide, loving invitation. And you're invited to take another deep breath, feeling your body. And with each breath, I'm gonna invite you to breathe in compassion. Feeling how that feels in your body. Breathing in compassion and exhaling grace. Breathing in compassion knowing that your behavior up until this point was exactly perfect. Breathing in compassion, knowing that you did the best you could with the tools that you had. Breathing in clarity. That everything you've done up until now you have done with the best of your ability and the purest intention that you were able to have from that space. And in that space of purity, 
in that space of knowing, in that space of acting, and doing the best that you could with the tools that you had, sometimes things didn't work out the way you expected or the way that we anticipated. Maybe our behaviors did not get the results that we desired, and that's okay. When our behavior did not give us the required results, what did we learn from that experience? What did we gain from that experience? All of that wisdom gained was only gain because we had the willingness to do. We had the willingness to be vulnerable. So I'm inviting you to see your behavior patterns and the things that you would like to upgrade as celebrations. Celebrate that you had the courage to act, that you had the courage to do, that you had the courage to attempt the results you desired. And when things didn't go as planned, you had the ability to see. Breathe in compassion for that excitement about being able to see and self-reflect. And when we're able to self-reflect and see, that behavior doesn't feel good anymore. It's not getting me the results I want. Wonderful. Wonderful. Let's celebrate that we have this behavior pattern that we get to own. If we were a victim, we get to celebrate and own that we now know what it's like to be a victim. And from this perspective, from this knowing, from this experience, we now have so much more perspective, so much more opportunity to make new choices. With every act that gets a result that does not feel good, we now have more information, more feedback, more opportunity, more choices. So instead of looking what it didn't work, what didn't work, we now celebrate the contrast and the opportunity to upgrade our behavior patterns, to make new choices. And with this now new knowing that we get to choose, I'm going to invite you to take a deep breath in and breathe in clarity. And with this new perspective, I'm going to invite you to take another deep breath in and ask yourself, what do I want? What do I want to experience? Who do I want to be? And if we can visualize and come clear on who do we want to be, what do we want to experience? Start creating that in your mind's eye. And as you create it, as you focus on what you want, See it. When we focus on who we want to be, and you see that in your mind's eye, really explore that. Now that you've seen who you want to be and what you want to experience, imagine you are 
having that experience now? What are you wearing in this experience? What are you feeling as you experience being exactly who you choose to be? How is your physiology different? How is your posture different? How is your facial expression different? And continue to breathe in, seeing yourself exactly as, as you want to be. Who are you sharing this experience with? What do you smell? What do you hear? What kind of words remind you of how amazing you are and who this person, this version of you is? What are the words you need to hear to remind you that this is who you choose to be and that you always have a choice? How does this feel in your body? How are your communication and behavior patterns different? Do you hold your head a little higher? How do you witness others differently from this place of power? This beautiful self-empowered version that you choose to be. How does this allow you to show up different? for others, as well as yourself. How do you see your relationships as you come from this beautiful, empowered, fulfilled version of yourself that you choose to be? Just feel this for a while. Feel it in your body. Breathe it in. Feel it in every cell of your body, knowing that your body has the power to transform into whatever your mind believes. This is you. This person you choose to be is you. It's the version that's right here, right now, if you choose to stay here. You do have this choice. The choice to respond. The choice to pause. The choice to be extremely intentional with your behavior, with your words with your energy. What kind of words does this version of you speak?
what behavior patterns and self-love and rituals support this version of you. I invite you to ask, what do I need to maintain this, to support this, to be this every day? And I invite you to trust the message that you hear. And I invite you to take this time to ask your higher self or your guides or whoever you're speaking with any other questions, personal stuff that you need help or guidance with, ask now. And then I invite you to ask, what is the best next step for me right now? And when you feel ready, when you feel complete, I invite you to keep this feeling in your body, knowing that everything you feel already is. This version of you that you see, that you imagine, that you choose to be, you are. You already are. To celebrate that and to trust the next step that was offered at you knowing that you only need one step at a time and doing that best step intentionally, authentically, with integrity and giving it all you've got will unlock the step after that. It's one breath at a time, one step at a time, one day at a time knowing that everything that is meant for us and who we are meant to be already is. So mote it be. So mote it be. Hmm. And if you are still in that space, I invite you to take your time and come back and join us at your own time, at your own pace, trusting yourself and allowing yourself to come to in your time. Thank you. Thank you, Willow. Oh, my. Very wonderful clearing. At uh, trance like. It was in Say space. that word again. Trance like. Trance like. Okay. Yeah. 
that there was again when I in the clearing and such, there was a nothingness with me for a while. There, your energy was was flowing through me in a way that was clearing out something I don't have words for. <laughs> Don't put words to it then, please. <laughs> yeah, again, that's what I am just kind of saying is is what what I experienced is beyond my vocabulary and I don't think it's needed to. Um, I hope anyone who's listening to this knows that this is my experience I'm describing. If yours is different, and it likely was, um, it was exactly the way it was supposed to be for you. Yes, thank you for that too. What a what. What a wonderful gift you're offering right now of allowing and reminding people that, yes, we each have our own experience. Thank you so much, Randy. You're welcome. Thank you, Willow. Um, it is about time to do the, well, if somebody would like to get to know you better on a one-on-one -on -one basis and or get access to your, your two books, how would someone yes. do that? My first book is I'm Sober, Now What? Since this is a sober community. And I wrote it to myself when I was a year and a half sober. And it's the tools and the mindset that I needed when I first got sober, thinking that sobriety is it, instead of realizing that when we get sober, that's actually when the work begins. <laughs> and then Rewriting Your Reality is the book that I wrote about falling in love with myself. And that has um, each chapter... I share what I went through, what I learned, and then the questions that I needed to ask myself to reprogram my mindset. And both of those can be found on groovywillowgreen.com, where there's also um, opportunities to work with me. There is a 30-minute discovery call there that is absolutely free. So if you're interested and you don't know what you want and you would like to explore just do a self-discovery call, then you're welcome to take advantage of that. And I would love to meet with people. Thank you so much for uh, opening up that. So groovywillowgreen.com. Okay. And we'll have the link below this as, as well too. Um, yeah. Do not have any idea what your time together with Willow is going to be. But if it's anything like I've experienced and such, it's been freeing liberating healing and for that i'm very very grateful i've received exactly what i need in this moment thank you willow thank you